Welcome to Techlandia, a podcast about and for the technology industry, a place to learn, connect, and engage with leaders and thinkers involved in the technology industry. You can check us out at techoregon.org, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to our latest edition of Techlandia. Skip Newberry with TAO, and we're excited to have as our guest today, Jess Burns, who's a science reporter and producer of All Science, No Fiction with OPB. Jess, it's wonderful to have you on. Thanks, Skip. I appreciate it for having me. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, with a lot of the interviews we do on this on this series, I always like to ask, you know, if you could share a little bit of information about you know, kind of how you ended up in your your current role as a, a science reporter and, and producer and kind of take us from your your past to the present, as it were. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have been in the journalism business for a little over 15 years now, maybe pushing 20. I haven't counted lately. Um, but, uh, you know, I started out and print, as so many people do, and moved into uh, radio after I went to the University of Oregon, a journalism graduate program there. Um, Started working in radio, realized I love the technology aspect of journalism, Um, that that creative production that came with radio. Um, Kind of bumped around a little bit, worked in the public radio sphere, but also worked in commercial radio, business radio, a a very short stint there as well. Um, And uh, ended up with uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting as an environmental reporter initially, um, and but then transferred about three years ago, right before the pandemic started, into uh, a science position. Um, and with that position, it was a little bit open, um, you know, how it was going to shake out as far as what specifically I focused on. Um, but coming out of the environmental reporting side of things where there isn't a lot of uh, great news happening, it's all kind of doom and gloom. Um, and then coming out of then going into the pandemic, which was <laughs> hard for everyone, but um, difficult for reporters, for sure. Um, And, you know, me as a science reporter, feeling the reception and seeing and reporting on the reception that um, scientists were getting and um, uh, the distrust that came with that and doing everything that I could to try to explain what was happening and get good, solid information out there you know, it was still pretty doom and gloom. Like it it felt like it was a long black tunnel and there was not much of a, um, uh, a light at the end of it, uh, at any point. Um, the light that I did see way off in the distance was whenever I did as an environmental reporter reported on what scientists were doing and on the technology side of things. Um, that they seem to be there offering um, solutions, um, looking for answers, you know, it, it felt like a real source of hope um, in all of this and looking at what scientists were doing and how amazingly scientists around the globe came together during COVID to basically, you know, get us a vaccine very, very quickly to understand, you know, what was happening with this virus and how it was spread very, very quickly. And I know living through it, we may not feel like it happened very quickly, but in scientific terms, it happened, all happened very, very quickly. Um, And, you know, the science evolved, like our understanding what was happening evolved as we got more information. And so, you know, this really, all of this kind of came together um, in my brain. And I said, you know, I'm tired of reporting on the doom and gloom. I want to report on solutions, solutions to our biggest problems, you know, whether that's health or whether that is, um, you know, natural disaster, disaster risk, 
whether that is climate change and all of the um, challenges ahead that we are facing and that we are going to be facing. And that was kind of where I came with All Science No Fiction as a story, uh, as a series that focused on science in the Pacific Northwest. We're Oregon Public Broadcasting, so we have a really um, a, a foothold regionally, like this is our, this is our area. Um, and, and I wanted to report on scientists that were coming up with solutions to all of these problems. And, you know, uh, we're, we're about, we're two years into it. Um, I'm working on the 10th episode right now, and, um, we've just been able to tell some amazing stories and, um, talk about some incredible science, technology, biomedical, just all over the map. So it's been quite a journey, but I'm, I'm, I'm really happy right now with how, where we've landed with the show and the direction it's going. That's fantastic. I mean, one, one, um, one theme that you've, you definitely alluded to is, you know, this focus around um, kind of factual reporting and you kind of hit upon an issue that has come up um, quite a bit in, in journalism and media, which is, you know, the element of trust. And, and I think mm -hmm. there's this sort of perceived crisis around what platforms and institutions and kind of individuals can we trust anymore? And and so there's this perceived gap in, you know, where material is coming from in terms of reporting and then how it's being delivered. And what what role do you see potentially this um, this show that you've, you've come up with and created uh, playing in all of that? Um, like, what would you like to see as one potential outcome, you know, take us forward a little bit and say like, okay, three years down the road, you know, all science, no fiction is having this kind of an impact. Well, I think one thing that we try to do is, you know, I try not to be the voice of the scientists. I try to let the scientists speak for themselves as experts on their work. Um, I really want to, um, as far as, you know, a trust in science, you know, these are human beings that are doing work they believe in, that work they're passionate about, and they are a lot of times doing it for the public benefit. You know, they're, they have goals that are about making society better. Um, and so through All Science No Fiction, I want to, you know, be able to help them along the way in kind of explaining what they're doing and the stakes that there are. But I also, I, I want to give them a voice in this. And um, we rely heavily on them showing us, you know, how they do their work, um, why they're doing their work, um, have them speaking, you know, from the, from, you know, pers their personal experience from the heart about why their work is important to them. Um, and I, I feel like right now, in a way, science is being perceived as, you know, a bunch of people who are disconnected from the real world that are doing their work in secret and, you know, are funded by, you know, nefarious play or funded, you know, through nefarious means and, you know, it just kind of has this this perception has really, I think, eroded uh, trust. Um, I think uh, globally we're kind of on a swing away from believing in science. Two, I think there's some larger um, uh, some larger currents that are happening. Um, if you look back in history, it happens all the time. You know, it, it happens multiple times, right? We swing. There's pendulum swings um, where we uh, you know, go away from science, uh, we go towards it, we go back and forth. And I think right now we're on a maybe a, a little, a minor swing away. But, you know, through my work, what I want to do is to, you know, lift the veil, um, mm -hmm. show people what they're doing, what these researchers are doing, have, let them talk for themselves about why they're doing their research um, and I think that these personal stories and just the, the peek inside, I think, can serve to demystify science and the scientific process um, in a way that I, I hope 
uh, increases overall trust in what is happening. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be critical. My job as a, uh, as a, as a journalist is to question, right? I ask tons of questions. I talk to scientists that aren't involved in the work about the work just to get, you know, a perspective of, you know, are these folks on the right track? Are there any obvious flaws in what the the approach that they're taking? Um, And, you know, all of this hopefully comes together to um, be able to increase the trust in science, because I think that is vital going forward um, with mm-hmm. with all of these huge challenges that we face. I mean, climate change is the is the big one. Right. We we've got some we've got some big hurdles to p- cover to, you know, big things to figure out over the next hundred years. And we're not going to get there uh, without science and without scientists. So, and, you know, and the other thing is I want to show people just how amazing researchers specifically in the Pacific Northwest are like there, we are just in a really amazing spot for science in the country and in the world. We have world-class institutions. Uh, We have nationally and internationally known researchers here doing really, really important work. And you know, just to be able to feature some of that work um, is such an honor for me. Um, it's amazing. I love it. Um, but I, I I want, you know, people in the Pacific Northwest to take pride in it and to know that, you know, we are, in many ways, we're at the center of things. And that's a, that's not a bad place to be. That, that's great. I mean, um, if I think about your background as, as an environmental reporter, too, I mean, just in my own struggles trying to uh, talk to my kids who oftentimes get kind of despondent. They, they look at the enormity of the problems that face us and, you know, they're, they're kind of like, you know, where to even begin, where to start. And mm-hmm. also how can I impact change? Like it's so huge. Right. The problem is so enormous. Like how can I impact this? And so how do you go about, I was wondering if you could walk, walk us through uh, for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with, with the show, like how do you select different stories and scientists to cover? Like, is there a certain threshold or criteria you look for? I wonder if you could walk us through that a little bit. Um, there's a there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Um, uh, one of thing in particular, I'm looking for a good story. Like, I'm looking, it, mm-hmm. I'm looking for people that are doing interesting work. And that are working on um, problems that we can understand. So there's a lot of science out there, and it's about making science better. And it's that's super important, right? Like this is very, mm-hmm. but this is kind of like, you know, I, I don't know, the mechanic in the, you know, working under the hood. Um, you don't, you know, making the car run better, um, and and that's really important. But you know. Science to make science better isn't exactly what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is the applied science that is really digging at the problem itself. Um, there's also foundational science. And 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 so that's another, uh, like, you know, uh, quantum physics. Like physics is a big one for foundational science. A lot of kind of geology is foundational science. Um, and once again, like we're talking about huge breakthroughs in our understanding of the universe that aren't immediately going to make a difference to our everyday lives, but, but, but our lives, but are important, you know, to our, hu- our to our, um, to our futures as a species, basically, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so I'm looking for more people that, you know, they are, you know, we did a story about, um, and it, it, it can be big, big, pro- big problems, and it can be little problems. Um, we did a story about um, a researcher up at um, the University of Washington who created a drone that uses a moth antenna as a sensor, because moth an- moths have an incredibly sophisticated sense of smell. 
And they're using, they're trying to create a drone that you can send into disaster areas, say you have a plant with a chemical spill, but you don't know where it's coming from. It's too dangerous to send in people. You'd really rather not send in dogs because, you know, we don't want to send in dogs if we don't have to. Um, But maybe we could fly a drone that is able to actually sniff the air and figure out where that chemical sensor is coming from. So that's a relatively like very like or or in in a search and rescue area, uh, develop that sensor so that it can detect carbon dioxide that we could maybe um, find people buried in rubble. Right. So these are very yeah. like a narrow use, um, a narrow use, but uh, case, but it's a solution to to a problem. Right. I, I, I like that. Um, I like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be huge science. Then I just did a story about um, the development of components, uh, a, a biodegradable honey based components for um, designed for computer components for neural network computing. Now, this is is potentially a huge solution, right? Because neural network mm-hmm. computing, it's a new it's a it's a new way that computer architecture is going. It can be faster, it can use a huge amount of less less energy. It's not nearly as energy um uh it's not ener- nearly the energy cow that, you know, our standard computers are relatively. And um, then we would also have components made of honey that you don't you can recycle without the use of toxic materials, thus creating less e waste. You know, so we're this is like something that is that is solving a big problem that we are going to face. You know, energy pollution. You know, all of these things. So it can be, you know, it can be down to the granular, like a pretty small use case, to the big one, but. I, to me, it just needs to have that, that nugget of, of, of wonder. Like it has to spark wonder in you. It has to spark your curiosity. Um, and, you know, and, and just for the format of the show, we need to be able to have a little bit of fun with it as well. Um, you know, the show takes a very kind of light, whimsical view of these and trying to explain some pretty complex science, but, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We try to keep it fun. We try to keep it easy to understand. Um, and, um, so that kind of goes into it as well. It, it's interesting. because, like some of the, if you look over some of the, um, sort of archival, uh, past episodes, it's, it's a mix of themes, right? So there's, there's some mm-hmm. that are a little more of this, um, kind of uh, surprising, confluence of two different things you wouldn't otherwise think to put together right so like honey yeah. and really sensitive computer chips right you know or one or like uh, you know something around like a moth's antenna and a drone like okay all right that makes sense so do you see like opportunities um or do you see like some of the biggest opportunities presenting us as a as a species around learning from the natural world and and is that an area where your environmental background um, kind of plays a role where you're seeing some of these kind of really interesting juxtapositions that maybe the average person wouldn't even think to search out? You know, so that's funny. I've, I've never, I've never thought about it in that way, but I, you know, I think you're onto something there. So, you know, one of the, the ways that, you know, when you think about looking to the natural world as a, as, as inspiration or as a potential solution for some of the issues that we face. I mean, one thing, way, one way to think about it is like, we've had, they, nature has had millions of years of evolution, right? To, um, to come to the most efficient um, and effective uh, way to solve problems. And mm-hmm. oftentimes we have problems that are like, a couple decades old, you know? And so when you right. look at the scale, the scale of time that we're talking about, you know, it, it's smart it, to look to nature because in many ways, nature has figured it out. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of research out there about incorporating natural products. Like, you know, uh, one, one, one I saw was like 
having concrete that used um, chitin, which is chitin, which is like the material that's in the shells of crabs and shrimp. And, you know, the, the adding this to concrete increases the strength. Uh, that was a story I wanted to do, but the researcher moved to California and I was out of luck. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, it, it was really, it was really um, fascinating work. Um, and then, you know, that inspiration of, you know, with computers, neural network computing is basically a style of computing that is, um, that takes its inspiration from how our brains work because our brains are incredibly efficient, incredibly complex, and they use such a small amount of electricity. Like it, it takes, uh, it, compared to the computer that you're sitting in front of right now, our brain is, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know the exact number, but I would thousands and thousands and thousands of times more efficient in its uh, ability to process data uh, for the amount of energy that it takes to do it. And so why not? try to mimic that because, you know, nature kind of figured it out for us. And so um, let's, let's use it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I also think we're, we're going to just see, um, you know, it, there's going to be a need for interdisciplinary science, basically people coming from all different kinds of backgrounds and approaching a problem from all different levels. And I, you know, and I'm sure this is happening in the business and tech world all the time, that you're stronger when you have people from, you know, vastly different backgrounds that can bring something new to the table or bring a new, uh, something, uh, you know, add something to the table. And I, I think you're seeing a lot of that when dealing with things like climate change is you're getting people from, all different groups uh, coming together and trying to figure out how do we solve this problem? How do we then implement implement the solution? Um, how do we, you know, work with communities so that they're they're part of that solution? You know what I'm saying? So it's it's mm -hmm. you've got a lot of um, uh, I think I, I think that's another way that we're going to see a lot of um, advancement and. Um, in, in how we approach these problems. I mean, one thing that I love about, um, you know, the, the approach that you've taken with this, this program is that so much of science and you could argue technology as well, one of the disconnects that people have to it is, you know, how does this apply to my day to day? It seems kind of mm -hmm. esoteric. It's, it's not applied, as you said earlier, right? So you're, you're making it applied and you're focusing on stories that are you know, real world examples, right? This is, this can impact mm -hmm. the average Oregonian, Washingtonian, whatever watching and say, oh, wow, that this, this could be huge. Uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, you mentioned the multidisciplinary aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. What would you give in the way of advice to folks who are looking to pursue a career in science or technology? Mm -hmm. Like what lessons does your show have in your experience talking to these scientists have for folks who are starting out? Um, well, I think that the opportunities are there and, um, you know, they're, uh, I would say like any industry, there are kind of waves of, um, interests that kind that happen and, you know, something that was, and I, and I'm blanking for a response, uh, uh, an example from the past, but something that was getting a lot of interest 10 years ago, you know, things move quickly and now we're moving into a different, uh, you know, uh, where the focus is pushed on different things. You know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I guess I would say there are to pay attention to where things are going and where our biggest problems are. Um, you know, the renewable energy sector research, you know, the, the, the work that's going into that right now, it seems like there's a huge amount of opportunity. Um, and, you know, and once again, like that is everyone from the chemists that's trying to de develop a better battery 
to a physicist that's trying to, you know, bring um, fusion <laughs> mainstream and not just at Oak Ridge mm -hmm. National Lab. Um, I think it was Oak Ridge. Was it Oak Ridge or was it Lawrence Livermore? So. Ooh, that's that's. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I should know that. Um, one of the or, national labs. You know, <laughs> it's one of the national labs, right? Like a huge breakthrough uh, that happened last year. Um, at, all the way down to, you know, social sciences, you know, working with victims of disasters, figuring out, um, you know, where we should and we shouldn't be building based on climate trends that are coming up how to um, communicate with people who are in communities that are being impacted with them in order to come to, you know, get solutions that everybody can be on board with and that can make progress. You know, like there's there's a lot of, in, in that solutions field to me, it, it feels wide open. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I don't know. I, 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 it feels like there's a lot of, um, a lot of space there uh, for people to get. And, and, you know, I, a lot of times I focus on um, university academic research. Um, uh, but, you know, as you know, the private sector is, is, is thriving in certain areas. Um, and I think that there's just so many opportunities all over the place. And, you know, I, I think that no one will argue that there's a need for more engineers and more, you know, people with <laughs> technical expertise, right? You, right. We, we need it. Right. I mean, to your point, like the world's become far more complex and just from mm -hmm. like a democratic or sort of civic standpoint, having more folks who understand those complexities, they're going to be able to contribute mm -hmm. better to, you know, as voting members of, of society. Um yeah, it, it's huge. I mean, so there's there's almost like a like a social aspect too to um, sort of some of the, the reporting. And, and I think about tech companies that for years now have, have hired anthropologists. You know, you made the point earlier about social sciences being uh -huh. relevant. Are, are yeah. you seeing opportunities? Like, um, I mean, clearly you are, because you mentioned that in, in some of your comments. But do you see kind of hope for folks who want to pursue a liberal arts careers first and then maybe get a technical degree to say, no, 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 like <laughs> it's multidisciplinary. The future is multidisciplinary. <laughs> well, you know, it, like the future is multidisciplinary, dis disciplinary, but also highly specialized, right? I, yes. You know, it's, I, there's, <laughs> yes, there's, and, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like there's this, there's, I don't know. I mean, I have a liberal arts background. I mean, I did English literature before getting into mm -hmm. journalism. And I mean, I've always had an interest in science, but I don't. And, and a lot of science journalists come from science backgrounds. Um, to me, the big. Uh, the big, I, I would say, like characteristics that will take you far in any of these fields is curiosity. I ask a ton of questions. I feel dumb all the time, right? Because I don't have this background, but I'm just asking questions. I'm just chipping away. And they're a lot of times they're not like the expert questions because I'm not an expert. I, you know, I, it's incumbent on me to get to the point where I can explain things. So that's what I do. I ask a bunch of questions. I, I just ask a ton of questions. So curiosity, I would say, you know, enthusiasm for what you're doing, you know, like uh, that, that's, that to me is a big one, like the bringing the positive attitude to it. And, um, and I would also say, um, Ooh, hold on. I had another one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got so excited about talking about how excited I was that it that it blanked my brain. Um, I, you know, I would say inflexibility and risk taking, like be willing right. to step out and um, you know get out of your comfort area um, in order to try to make things happen. Talk to people who you wouldn't necessarily normally talk with. Um, you know, learn something new. Um, constantly seek, you know, 
self-improvement when it comes to the field that you're in. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, curiosity is the big one for me. Like I will have, I, mean, a, I, I, I will talk with anyone who is curious because I think it's such an amazing thing. Well, it really comes out in, in your reporting and, and just in talking to you today too. Like I, I'd underlined it a couple of times here in my, my notes as we're going along, like wonder, curiosity. Yes. Huge. And, mm -hmm. you know, talking to a lot of uh, employers that we work with at the tech association, they'll often say, you know, baseline fundamentals, what we look for in any new hire is, you know, wonder, curiosity, enthusiasm for the work, and you can kind of train and or figure out the rest. And so true. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, that's how you have success in science and, and in, in technology. It's, um, it's, it's really great. I was, I'm imagining that you're, you're probably, um, you've seen a lot of, of things that are probably pretty outlandish or somewhat surprising at the very least. And I'm wondering, as we kind of near the, the end of our, our time, if you could share what's one of the most surprising stories you've covered recently. The most surprising. So one of the things, um, and I have an episode coming up on this, so I'll, I'll give it away, but um, I want to, I'm just kind of <laughs> right fascinated here, folks. by this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it'll be, it'll be good. You should watch it. Even if you know what the story is about. Um, it's these folks um, who, uh, there's a big consortium of folks that are working, that are studying Cascadia. Um, so Cascadia mm -hmm. as in the, the earthquake falls, the subduction zone. So there's a, uh, just in case you've been living under a rock, <laughs> um, <laughs> a little bit off of Oregon's coast, uh, the Juan de Fuca plate is basically being pushed underneath the North American plate. So there's a giant land mass that's pushing under uh, the coastline. And um, the coastline has been rising. Those mount, this, that coast range, that's, that's, that's Cascadia. They're pushing it up. And at some point, maybe soon that's going to slip right and when that slips when that when the when the land like loses its traction and flattens back out um we're going to it's going to be trouble right it's going to be the, the big one as we say um and uh one of the big questions is being asked right so there's all all, all kinds of things that happen when that happen right the, the ground shakes we get shaking uh there's the tsunami because the seafloor right. moves. And so the seafloor comes in. But one thing that I don't think a lot of people, and I for sure didn't, really realize is that when that happens, when that earthquake happens, instantly, relative sea level on the Oregon, Washington, Northern California coast up into Vancouver is going to drop. That means, you know, if you were three meters above, above sea level now, or nine feet above sea level. Now you might only be three feet above sea level. If you were, you know, six feet above sea level, you may be at sea level, which is trouble on the coast, right? <laughs> Cause the sea right. is there. Right. And so there's going to be immediately immediate subsidence, which makes the tsunami much worse, right? So the tsunami yeah. gains height because the ground has dropped. The relative height of the ground has dropped. So um, there's all kind of research out there trying to figure out um, what we should expect to see at different spots on the coast. And they're looking back in time to do it. And this group of scientists um, are uh, looking at their, their, their paleogeologists, I believe is what they're called. They're looking at the populations of these diatoms, which are microscopic organizations. They have silicon, silica out, out, outer shells. They're beautiful, um, but you can't see them with the naked eye. Um, they're going, they're doing core samples and they're looking at diatom populations in the history, um, specifically around the 1700 Cascadia, which was the last big one on the West Coast. And um, using um, these diatoms and how knowledge they have about where different species of diatoms live in the coastal range, they're looking and they're able, they're able to see how much different spots in the, um, along the Oregon coast 
um, subsided, how, how much the land dropped up during the last thing. And I just think that is so freaking fascinating, right? You're looking at microscopic organisms that are basically fossils now. Right. And you can put them under a microscope. You can figure out which ones are where. And they tell you, you know, how much, they, you know, through statistics and all kinds of mathematical ways of looking at it, they tell you how much the land dropped. And to me, that, that it freaking blows my mind, right? Like, who would thought? Who would have thought about this? Like, it. it I. I don't know. I'm. I'm in such awe of even just like beginning to come to this conclusion that you would be able to figure something out by, you know, digging into the ground, looking at the diatoms, figuring out where they are in reference to where the tsunami sand is in the in the record. And be able to come back and be like, oh, yeah, seaside's going to drop 1.5 meters. I'm coming. That's off the top of my head. <laughs> so but, you know, <laughs> seaside is I, seaside is going to subside, you know, but we, we right. have a better idea of how much it's going to subside subside based on this work. So anyway, that kind of stuff I freaking love. Oh, my God. I love it so much. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Tune in. It's that so one's cool. coming out probably uh, early summer. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that was definitely a, a nice teaser for it. And it's, um, it, it's kind of cool, you know, this, this idea that, you know, nature holds so many answers if we're willing to ask the right questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. Are we willing just to kind of look, right? Like, yep. just be curious. Be cur It goes back to curiosity, right? Like, there you go. Be, there you yeah. Go. So. I love it. That that's a great way to to wrap up our our time together. Um, again, thank you for for taking the time out of your busy schedule to to share some of your experiences with us. And um, you know, I, I hope that uh, many of our listeners will if they haven't already consider um, you know checking out some of some of your episodes. Um, it's it's fantastic. Um, great service to the Northwest, and I, I think the you know, the wonder and curiosity and enthusiasm that you bring to your work is, is infectious. Um, so <laughs> we need more of that, uh, especially telling the stories about how science and technology really impact our day-to-day -day lives. So, so thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, 